Welcome to another issue of the Cool Tool Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Ryan Phelan. And we've known each other for a long time, but Ryan, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's a treat to be a part of Cool Tools since I use so many of your cool tools and have forever. Um, Kevin, you and I go way back to the very beginning of when you, when my husband, Stuart uh, Brand, uh, recruited you to work at the Whole Earth Catalog. Yeah. So um, I've watched you develop all your uh, incredible skill set and experience over all these years with great pleasure. Um, where I fit in with all this is I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've run several companies and nonprofits <clears throat> and um, have collaborated with Kevin on a number of projects, including the All Species Foundation, trying to discover all life on Earth. But primarily, my current work is with an organization called Revive and Restore, which is bringing biotechnologies to conservation. And um, actually, Stuart Brand and I co-founded this organization 10 years ago. And, um, and it's going great guns, and I can tell you about it later if time permits. Yeah, yeah we'd love to hear about it. And I was just noticing that all species like <laughs> painting behind you where um, it reminds me of our, our work of trying to catalog all the species on the planet. And here are a bunch of them, which I have, don't know what they are, but um, they look really cool. These are all species that live in the canopy. And the painting is by Isabella Kirkland, who's uh, an amazing artist uh, working in the style of the Dutch masters in oil. Yeah, it looks really fantastic. What a prize. So, Ryan, um, why don't you tell us about... Um, your first uh, cool tools, um, something that you um, would really be loath to lose. Well, it's interesting, Kevin. I, I spent last weekend um, thinking about every tool that I use every weekend. And I have to mention this, that um, my husband, Stuart, and I live on a 65-foot tugboat most of the time. So our tools are very specific on that boat that we use. But we also have a, a weekend place where I have a proper garden, a real garden and a pasture. And I work with horses. And one of the tools that Stuart just gave me for my birthday last month, I would not live without if I didn't get it. So this is so perfect. It is what Stuart, uh, the, I opened the box and it said it was from Dirty Girls. I said, what? What is this coming from Dirty Girls? And the company is actually called Dirty Girls Gators. So I uh -huh. opened it up wondering what the hell, you know, what kind of toy was this? Yes. And I'm going to show you actually how you use it. Oh, okay. So this is a pair of my uh, uh -huh. weekend sneakers. And on the very back of this Dirty Girl Gator, as they call it, you apply a little uh, piece of Velcro. Right. And you put it on like a sock, but then you just roll it down and secure it with your Velcro. And then at the front of your shoe or boot, whatever it needs to have a lace, is just that little. Oh, cool. Right? I think, I think yeah. you can see that. Yeah. And what happens is when you are wearing one of these gaiters, um, you don't collect any foxtails. Uh, they just literally do not collect on the fabric. And you can get it in any gazillion of prints. Um, now, typical hikers use gaiters, um, I think, you know, going cross country and they you can get them waterproof and all of that. This particular company that Stuart purchased from just does fun wild fabrics, I think, in, in that simple uh, nylon fabric but you know it, they literally weigh nothing you could put it in your pocket right. and i just put it down in my garden shed and throw on those shoes and i love it right so that's, so it's not just foxes any kind of burrs or things that might ordinarily right. stick to your socks or and, and dirt kevin when i'm working in in my vegetable garden bids and i'm you know i've got a shovel you know and if i just have my running shoe on um you know you know, within a few hours, I've got all kinds of stuff in my shoe. Right, so right. That, problem solved. 
Right. That's really fantastic. And hikers sometimes use them as well, not just people who are working in gardens, but absolutely, you're absolutely. bushwhacking to any extent. Yeah. But usually they're more cumbersome. They're bigger, thicker. And what I love about that is just the simplicity. Right. Dirty girls, gators. Yes. Okay. All right. So another product that I use every weekend because I'm lucky enough to have a lap pool it is um, something called oh. Aftershocks um, Swim Buds. And the reason these are really cool, and I don't know if you can tell that there, is that they work on bone conduction. So oh. you literally put them over your ear, oh. in your ear. Wow. And the audio quality is actually better when you're underwater. Oh. And and so it's really quite amazing. Now, people can use these um, not just for swimming, but the sound quality is n not nearly as good probably as just a regular AirPod, you know. Um, uh -huh. But um, what's cool about these is that when you go underwater, it's really beautiful. And, um, you know, the limitation on these, there's different manufacturers out there. What I like about these aftershocks is just how lightweight and simple they are. They do not stream music. You actually download your music onto it. And you can download up to, I, I gather, eight hours of music. Okay. Um, I'm always switching it out. But, um, and apparently you can download audiobooks. I've not figured out, you know, music has gotten so complicated now with MP3s and MP4s and what you can download and what you can't. Um, there are all kinds of hacks around it. I haven't put the energy into those hacks. <laughs> but um, I'm sure uh, your cool tool audience probably know all about it. The ones that do streamlining on Bluetooth obviously, you know, solve that problem just by grabbing it out of, of the ether. But they are bulkier. I, I ordered some and I really didn't like I didn't like the weight you know this you just put on your goggles and your uh, swim cap and it's just in place and you don't even know it's on except that you're rocking out while you're swimming that is so cool I love that wow underwater earbuds okay that's so cool yeah but you know the other thing about bone conduction is um, what's wonderful is it doesn't tune out real sound so if while I'm swimming Somebody wants to call me, you know, and not telephone, but, you know, yell at, yells at me outside of the water or I hear a plane go by or I hear a bird call. I totally hear it. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed when you see a cyclist on a busy street plugged in with mm -hmm. their earbuds being, you know, absolutely oblivious to the traffic going by. I wish they were using bone conduction because it would be totally aware of their environment at all times yeah 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 that's really cool i i wonder if you could hear well enough uh on a bicycle to to make that worth absolutely okay. i believe it. it you can you know sometimes i don't even remember i have it on and i'm having a conversation with someone and i'm you know punching it to lower it uh just to hear them better but i'm completely able to converse wow wow um but um again you know, everything's a trade-off. And and uh, the, the brand that you like, again, is called? Um, it's called Aftershocks. Aftershocks, with a, okay. With, spelt with a Z. All right. Shocks. Aftershocks, that's really great. I'm sure you'll find a link. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Okay, so then back to my weekend. Um, uh, because I have a vegetable garden and because I love fresh produce and fresh veggies, I'm amazed at how much garden waste we create. And I have found composting really on site to be a pain um, and it, for a number of reasons. But I've never liked just throwing all my garbage into the trash either. And so there's this product called Lomi, L-O-M-I, that I saw on a Kickstarter campaign, I wanna say I, maybe a year ago. And um, they said, you know, turn your garden waste into garden soil. And they had a picture of it mocked up on a kitchen counter and, you know, a relatively small, um, uh, you know, kitchen appliance. And I thought, well, that, that is a really cool idea. So I 
plop down 500 bucks or something as a Kickstarter person and forgot about it. And about nine months later, uh, I got an email saying, your Lobie's arriving. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you know, it's clearly been kind of a first generation tool. And I assume everyone that comes off their assembly line now, which is continuing to improve. But Stuart and I were really pretty thrilled with it and we're using it. Okay. Um, How does so it work? It uh, so it basically uh, processes down and it's, you know, the unit is about this big. Um, it's not noise free. There's a hum on it. And so uh, we're fortunate enough to have a kind of an enclosed pantry room right next to our kitchen. And I plug it in there. And every two days or something on a weekend, something like that, we'll turn it on overnight or, you know, run for five hours. And what comes out of it, I just grabbed a little baggie of it, is what looks like soil. Wow. Can and what went into it was all your kitchen, kitchen waste. It was avocados, bananas, fish, bones. If you wanted to do it, you'd throw your chicken in here. You can throw any, you can actually throw your paper towels, other stuff in. It will grind it all up and decompose it in five to eight hours, depending on your setting and depending on um, how fine you want it. Huh. I do it on kind of a medium fine. And I, uh, you know, I literally just take from, I want to say maybe a, a gallon of fresh veggies and everything else, or, you know, decomposed bananas. I will throw it in and I will get out five hours later more than a pint of this. And wow. I then go add it into my veggie garden. Right, right. Um, I just kind of work it into the soil. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, now, so do you have any idea what it was doing? Is it it's grinding it up and then it's like maybe heating it and cooking it? Yeah. Yes. And it goes through, you can see it goes through its different little cycles. Um, I, I haven't, I, I don't want to opine on the magic of these uh, machines. I was concerned at how much um, energy they take because I do uh -huh. hear it. I mean, away in there a little bit. And, but on their website, they will tell you that uh, it's no, uses no more electricity than your dishwasher. Uh -huh. um, I don't know how it's doing those metrics. Is it running my dishwasher for five hours or just a dishwashing cycle and a <laughs> compost cycle? So, um, but, you know, they're stating it's, you know, very sustainable and uh -huh. clean. Um, and it's really a wonderful thing to take all that stuff that you consider garbage right. and turn it into something that you can throw in your garden. It's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah, because we have we have a big recycling bin, which I mean a green waste bin that, yeah. that could become um, compost because you're making compost basically a short it's like a shortcut version of it. It's a shortcut version. Yeah, and. Um, Anyway, so, um, you know, we're still experimenting with it, seeing how it fits yeah. in our life. I, I, you know, my counter space on the tugboat is too small. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be hearing it right there in my galley. Yeah. Uh, use up the space. So it's for a certain, um, certain situation. But I think most people's homes actually could allow for it. Yeah. There are competitors I've noticed sort of coming on the market, and I haven't done any competitive analysis on these kinds of home composters, but um, it, it's something that is, I think going to be present in all our homes. Wow. So, yeah. Like, a, like a garbage disposal, you have a composting unit. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Maybe even built in. Yeah. That would be sweet. Yeah. Okay. You ready for another one? I am. <laughs> these are all great. I, these are all fantastic. I had, I love it when people are telling me tools I have no idea that even existed. So keep going. Well, Kevin, I can't believe that this last one isn't something that you know or use, but um, I am wearing right here an aura ring. Right. I don't want to be giving you the finger, but I'm going to show you what is inside this ring. Oh, okay. Are the sensors. Yeah. This one this one happens to be kind of a gold metal band. Uh -huh. um, and I saw one of these maybe 
a year ago on a friend at a conference. And I said, you know, what's with this? I noticed somebody else wearing these. And he said, well, you know, I mean, it tracks all your health metrics. And I know, Kevin, you've been into tracking your metrics for- Quantify itself for a while. For long. how long? Is it a decade or more? Yeah. Well, yeah, it was probably 2008 or something. So maybe 15 years. Yeah. yeah. You were one of the first to even- right. I did coin it, the quantified self. Is that your- Very Wolf and I, uh, yes. We coined yeah. a quantified self. Um, yeah. the very first meeting was in this studio here. Um. I just I put an announcement said um, if you're quantified selfing, come to the meeting. And I have no idea what the word means, but if you think you are, and one of the people who showed up is Tim Ferriss. That's great. I remember so, those early days. Yeah. So now you are now you have a quantified self magic ring, and what does it do? Well, um, what it tells me about better than any other product because I also have on an Apple Watch um, is my sleep and. Mm -hmm it really shows you your sleep. And of course, all of that is, you know, connected to your Apple, oh, yeah. uh, to your iPhone, and you can pull it up every morning, whatever. But it does a better job with sleep than any other product I think out on the market. Other things, you know, your Apple Watch can do fine. You know, it, it will follow your footsteps and all of that and keep track of it. It will also, your iPhone will import both of these da datas too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the part that's really interesting about it is that, um, so Stuart and I both started wearing it pretty much at the same time. And it's been a really fun thing to compare in the morning over a cup of coffee. It was sort of like, well, how'd you sleep last <laughs> night? <laughs> I, did a, I did an 82. How about you? <laughs> oh, yeah. What's your readiness score? Well, I'm at 90. You know, you're at 80. What's going on? Right. <laughs> and, um, but it does give you just another little sense of uh, what you're doing. Now, here's where it got profound. And um, so I've been kind of doing it mostly because Stuart's been on a fitness thing for a while. And, and uh, and feeling his age, he's really wanted to really, you know, monitor his weight. And, you know, you know he's on a very um, religious weightlifting mm -hmm. uh, jag at the moment. I hope he continues it, but um, I think it's serving him well. But um, it was maybe a month ago that he said to me, gosh, my scores, my readiness score, is really low this morning. And by the way, it was low yesterday morning. When we looked at his phone and it was like, I wonder if something's not right. I mean, what is, what's wrong? Well, his heart was a little higher mm -hmm. and his body temperature was a little higher each night for two nights in a row. Well, guess what? On Monday morning, he woke up feeling like, oh my God, I think I have COVID. Mm. And he tested positive. This is just five weeks ago. And then he went back and looked at those scores. And they were completely different than anything mm. um, that he'd had ever, you know, in the last year of using this product. So isn't that interesting that the body was already fighting an infection? It was already... Mm -hmm showing some reaction to to the virus the stress way before he had a scratchy throat way before he felt any lethargy it was just sort of perplexing to him mm. and um so you know i think the sensitivity is there right and so, so that now you would know um you would read it differently yeah absolutely i mean it did not say COVID alert you know, it's, <laughs> it's not doing diagnostics yeah, yeah. You're paying attention to these things. I mean, it was basically telling them, take it easy today. Mm -hmm. And it said, take it easy today. I mean, it actually gives you those messages. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe you ate a really late meal or had, a, you know, alcohol too late in the evening that kept you awake. Your heart never really, um, heart rate never really lowered until just before you woke up. Well, that's not a restful sleep. Wow, wow. It's not a restorative sleep. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> that's really fantastic. Um, we had to get um, Dr. Alan Green, who was in the ring, to help him um, tweak his jet lag regimes. Oh. Uh, because there's an app that 
will help you on stage before you leave. The, yeah. Exposure to light, caffeine, rest, and stuff. And he could use the motor ring to verify and test how his heart rate and stuff, how well that pre-adjustment for jet lag was working. Huh. That's a really cool use of the ring. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's got stuff for uh, it, menstrual cycles and fertility. You know, all these things are being integrated. Um, tools that you imagined in your early quantified self days, right. I think, are becoming, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, right. just better crafted and better designed and, and more applicable. Do you have a recommendation? Are there different models of the of the ring and um, are they all just? Um, I think the, probably the only one you can buy is the latest upgrade, and I think that incorporates um, you know all the sleep uh, data that I was talking about, but also um, oxygen saturation level, which of mm -hmm. course is something during COVID that we've all begun to learn is such an early indicator of problems. Right, right, um, and so that's embedded in it. Um, but I, really cool. I, it's just how it comes. That's really great. Well, thanks, Ryan. That's another fantastic tool. I had known about it, but I didn't know as much about it as what you just suggested. It seems like a a great step forward in you know your own taking responsibility for your own health. It's really yeah. great. Which you have been involved in for a very, very long time, way before me. Um, but now you're on to to something else. So you want to tell us. Um, Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're right, Kevin. After spending three decades uh, working in healthcare, um, trying to help uh, consumers get better access to medical information, this was way before the internet and way before WebMD, which is the company that I sold my medical library to. Um, we were trying to help arm consumers to be able to be on a more equal footing with their doctors. And that was really radical. And that's really what this self-care stuff is about. It's mm -hmm. like giving you insight, you're not gonna get from the doc, right? This is your own data. And, and in order to really think about your health, you've got to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been on that bent for yeah. a long time. And in fact, it took me into my next uh, business, which was called DNA Direct, working in personal genomics, trying to provide uh, consumers with access to clinical medical genetic testing. Which was and just before 23andMe. Way before 23andMe. Right. And before, yeah. um, really before breast cancer testing for women, um, you know, with, with using genomics was readily available other than through very specialty breast cancer clinics. And of course, now it's ubiquitous for any woman who's got a, a, a potential diagnosis of breast cancer that, that you do that kind of screening. But anyway, when I sold that company, which was called DNA Direct, um, I really wanted to leverage my passion and interest in genomic technology. And um, I wanted to do it in a new field, and I wanted to do it in conservation. And uh, and that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years. And so you won't be surprised to know that part of what we look at is genomics and wildlife disease, right? Because when you think about health, whether it's human health or species health, you also have to deal with disease. And, um, and so we're working uh, with America's most endangered mammal, which is the black-footed ferret, um, we've just cloned one cell line that has unique genetic variation. We're going to do more of that work. But we're also looking at how to help black-footed ferrets cope with sylvatic plague. And um, they you know, succumb to plague uh, every other year, depending on the seasonality of, of the spikes in sylvatic plague on the American prairie. It's an invasive pathogen, shouldn't be here, but it has been um, all across the American prairie since I think the 50s. And so we're looking at that. We're looking at uh, chytrid disease uh, with, uh, with bats. We've got um, Revive and Restore runs a program that we call the Catalyst Science Fund. And we now have raised just about 
I want to say 15 million for the Catalyst Science Fund to advance research in all these different areas where conservation is stymied by what they call an intractable problem, you know, chytrid disease or, or plague or the loss of genetic diversity. We're, we're using this fund to say, well, let's advance research in this particular area that might become a solution. And if we can do it in the sort of early R&D stage, then we're, we can look for translation, transition partners that will help bring this into uh, more standard practice in conservation. So, um, you know, we're in, an instigator, we're a catalyst, but we're actually um, really now a funder. We have 40 different research teams all around the world now working in this area. That's really, really fantastic. And you're using your genetics to um, both investigate these diseases and their um, effects, but also to try and overcome them in some cases. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we're not a research center that wants to just study the problem at all. Um, and in fact, if we think it's going to be a big, long academic study, we don't even go there. What we are... Our, our sort of sweet spot is where someone is proposing to us that utilizing these technologies has a very pragmatic potential solution. So we're doing a lot of work with coral. We call it that we're building the advanced coral toolkit. So there's a lot of work being done on coral with the problem of bleaching with warming waters and ocean acidification. Um, we're looking at the, the ability to develop coral stem cells, stem cell technology that's never been developed for corals. We're drafting behind research that's been done in human medicine uh, and other projects we draft behind work that's been done in agriculture. Um, you know, so we're not, you know, we're not so far out there that we can't try to come up with something that could actually be applied in the field its own day. That's really, really fantastic. I know you have a great website with a lot more information on this, but it's Revive and Restore. Is that right? Uh, yes. The name of the organization is Revive and Restore. Our website leaves out the and in the URL. So okay. revive.restore.org. Okay, great. Um, that is really, really great. I mean, it, it, it's like, um, what's the word I want? I think it's just really brilliant where you took two lines of scientific work, conservation and genetics, and brought them together in a way that none of the conservation people were ever thinking about, and none of the genetics yeah. folks were thinking about. That well, it's, kind of white space between the two. Is, it is, and, and, and it's really these interdisciplinary teams, Kevin, that has, has made it work. So very often when we want to tackle a problem, we actually do a workshop. We used to do it in person, but, you know, last few years by Zoom, we'll bring in, you know, George Church, leading genome engineer, and we'll match him up with uh, the scientists working on herpes virus in elephants. And we'll match that up with the conservationists on the ground in Africa. And we really think through the whole context of the problem, which is that herpes causes infant mortality in elephants like nothing else. Mm. And so you you take a problem that no one has known really what to do and you bring the team members together and they start actually, you know, creating a roadmap for a solution. And then we try to scare up the money for it to fund these things. And, um, and that's always a challenging part, but, you know, so far we've got a really good track record and, um, and we're finding that these camps want to work together. You know, there are conservationists who really do want to use these tools. Right. And we don't want to see it as an outlier. Ultimately, we just think the conservation toolbox needs to get bigger. Yeah, yeah. That's really fantastic. Well, you're, you're really good at building bridges, as always. So, um, this is a great place to have you give your... Tremendous energy and intelligence. I'm really glad you're there. And thank you for sharing your cool tools with us today. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to. And of course, I wouldn't get to do what I'm doing if there weren't really cool people to yeah. work with. And, and you are one of the coolest. So thank you.
We are glad that you enjoyed this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Just want to remind you that we have some other coolish material on our YouTube channel here. Please subscribe, comment, like. In addition, um, this Cool Tools Show and Tell is also available in an Audible podcast form. You can subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to other podcasts if you just wanted to listen. And if you're listening, know that there is a visual version of this on our YouTube channel where we're actually showing the tools and um, there's a little bit more of a visual component there. In addition, the same folks that put us, uh, the Cool Tools website out, we also put out a free newsletter every week. It's very, very short. It's one page or less. We recommend six very brief items um, that are very succinct, easy to read. You can deal with it in a couple minutes. And every week we bring to you the six cool things that we have uncovered and want to share. And it's called Recommendo with one M, recommendo.com. You'll be able to find it there. It's free. Join 50,000 plus other subscribers every Sunday morning. You'll get it in your email box. And it's actually one of the most popular things that we produce. But we do produce other newsletters as well. One of them is called What's in Your Bag. We have one that goes out to um, tools and tips for your workshop. So you can get those at our website um, and they are also free. And finally, um, I wanna mention the fact that um, we do have a Patreon and um, this uh, podcast and this vidcast are supported by Patreon supporters. The minimum is a dollar a month. And for that, you get um, an email to ask us anything. We will respond and um, answer your question if we're able to. There are other higher levels. You can all see those at our Patreon page. And all those links are below right here. So thank you again for being a fan. And um, we'll keep producing stuff if you enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you all to this week's patrons who include Jay Walker, Nikolai Teleguine, Charles Cowens, David Sue, Jack Unverfirth, Michael, Lawrence Lazare, David Abel, Edward Grobe, and Juiced Dozberg. Thank you all.